Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure for us in another episode of the Tennis Talk Coaches and Leader Voices to have a great leader, a great international personality is with us, Dr. Jack Grobel. Hi, Jack. Hi, Fernando. How are you? Great to, great to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you to be with us on the first episode of November, and uh, which is very important because the Tennis Talk is about to create a bridge between the top person, the top leaders like you, with people from the, of tennis and from everywhere, from all over the world, understanding what it takes to be a high-performing person. To do an introduction uh, about Dr. Law, Dr. Groppel, I have to say he is a performance and leadership expert. Uh, he was working in different areas. He, uh, he did and authored many, many books Uh, he was a Kilimanjaro climber, which is a very important aspect because it was a, a very good story about that. We're going to touch a little bit in our episode. Dr. Gropel is a fellow in the American College of Sport Medicine, as well as a fellow in the American College of Nutrition. Dr. Gropel is certified like a nutritionist as a former research associate of the USA Olympic training center. He did a lot for our sport. He was working with like players like Pete Sampras, Michael Jang, uh, John McEnroe, and many, many others. And he did a great contribution creating and founding, you know, the sports science committee in, United, in the USDA. And also actually he's professor of uh, exercise sports science and business uh, in the Judson, Judson University. And which is very important, recently he received the USPTA Hall of Fame Award in a recognition of tremendous trajectory helping to develop our sport, which is an honor for us. Thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Let me ask you the first question, which is related sure. of the process, how to become a high-performing person. Who is Jack Grobel. <laughs> well, it's, it's 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 probably an answer now, and then there would have been a different answer, you know, 20 years ago, and maybe even another answer even before that. But right now, you know, it's interesting. I'm a guy who wakes up every morning, and I have no regrets. I look forward to what I get to do that day. And I think a lot of people, I think, I think that's the way to live your life. I have a sense of purpose. Wake up and say, good morning, I'm ready to go, versus oh my gosh, it's morning. And I, I think I'm very purpose driven. I love my family dearly. Uh, my son, my sister, nephews, you know, I'm, I'm just very close to them. I have some deep friendships that I've had throughout my entire life almost. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's key. I'm purpose driven and I wake up every morning and I'm excited about the day. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the people who know you, You know, we, we, we can say about it, no? You, you are Thank always you. very positive and plenty sharing energy to keep going. Thank you. Let, Thank let, you. Me, let me, because you are a magnific magnificent uh, leader, also scientist, and also teacher, coaching others, you know? How was this, that process, let's say, from a, a young Jack, plenty okay. of dreams, vision, to become who you are right now? Yeah, well, the young Jack grapple I mean, was lost, to be very honest with you. Um, you know, at 22, I had a bachelor. I played tennis at the University of Illinois, and I had a bachelor's degree. Um, I mean, I won't even go into that detail because my degree, I wasn't able to do anything with it. I started graduate school in genetics, mm -hmm. and I was lost. I was absolutely lost. And my sister, bless her heart, every time I tell this story, she said, why don't you go talk to the people in kinesiology? And I said, well, dad, dad won't support that at all. And mm -hmm. uh She said, don't, don't care. You're 22. Go talk to them. And I said, yeah, but I can't pay for everything. She said, don't, I don't care. Go talk to them no matter what. And by the grace of God, I'm serious that they admitted me to the master's of science program in kinesiology. They gave me an assistantship to teach tennis. And then the field of sports science was really new in the United mm -hmm. States. Um, yeah. Chuck Dillman, who was my kinesiology professor, who became my advisor, Chuck said to me, I'll never forget it, 17 words, Illinois has written about this, University of Illinois has written about this. 
you know, he said, Jack, if you really apply yourself, you could become a pine, pioneering leader in the science of tennis performance. And that was Very all good. it took. But you got to understand that didn't even exist. So here I am going, OK, let's go. And so the door opened and I without any substance whatsoever, I went through the door um, and basically, you know, and then I started doing some research and slowly got my legs underneath me. And I went to Florida State for my PhD. My director of my dissertation was Robert Singer, who was world renowned in sports yeah. psychology. Very so good. right away, I'm introduced to a multidimensional approach. And then Vic Braden heard about me and he took me under his wing. And Vic did a lot to help me get the word out. You know, I didn't, I learned a lot about science from Dr. Dillman and Dr. Singer, but mm -hmm. Vic helped me communicate with players and coaches better. And I owe Vic. Vic and Vic's uh, memory a, a ton. So that's that's what the young Jack Grapple did. I mean, I basically the door opened and I went through it with no, well, like I said, with no substance. But then it was just I built the foundation very slowly. Mm -hmm. Jim Lair and I met. We started working together, and then in the early '80s, you know, I was working with Tim Gullickson, Rick Vetter from Milwaukee had introduced me to a, a USPTA pro had introduced me to Tim Gullickson. Jim was working with Tom. And that literally is the first, then Jim and I, even though we'd known each other, we weren't really working together with athletes. So here, I mean, think, talk about the opportunity. You're working with identical twins who are among the top two doubles teams in the world. And you get to travel with them and, and work with them based on your scientific background. So, you know, so a field that didn't really exist, we were able to create a foundation for what became the Human Performance Institute many years later. Very, very interesting. I, I didn't know that story. Oh, you, you didn't. Met, okay, oh, good. You, oh, you met Jim uh, with the Gullickson. Yeah, well, I actually met Jim a little before that at the ten Tennis Teachers Conference in New York City. But we didn't really, we knew each other. We were going to conferences together and we knew we really liked what each other was doing. We had a connection, but we didn't really work together until Tim and yeah. Tom got into the picture together. Yeah, and the and the magical mm -hmm. process started to <laughs> to develop and, and to yeah. try to work together. Uh, it was just amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> well, absolutely. And um, let me let me ask you because the tennis talk is about uh, how we can help people to understand what it <laughs> takes you not know, to be a high performing person, and and and, and that trans and transformation, Jack. How was to face different difficulties, opportunities, how you deal with them? Well, I, I had to learn, I think Jim and I both, I think I had to learn skepticism really, really fast because remember, it's a new field. I mean, I honestly had people, I had, I had high speed 16 millimeter films showing mm -hmm. exactly what was going on in technique. And I actually had people say, well, that's not what happens. And I'm going, wait a minute, what do you mean? I'm showing you what happens. I've got it broken down uh, in hundreds of a second. And, I mean, I don't know if you, I don't even know if, Fernando, if you know this story, but what happened, it was in the early 80s and on a US Open telecast, I saw, mm -hmm. I'm not going to name any names, but I saw a world-class player give a tip about hitting topspin and they said, literally roll over the ball. And I'm going crazy in my family room in the early 80s. So what I did, I took stills from the 16 millimeter film I made pictures. I sent them to World Tennis Magazine at the time, World yep. Tennis. Yep. And they said, why don't you write an article? So then, And then after that, I ended up writing for them for about five, four or five years. And then I became an instruction editor for Tennis Magazine for almost 15 years. Yep. And that's how that got started, though. I wrote, so I, I, I basically either I had to face all the skepticism or I had to open the doors myself and show proof that what I was talking about had substance. And, and then this is a very important example because to to do your best version, let's say <laughs> actually you are your best be version because of course you collect all the years of experience, knowledge, right. successful ca cases. How was that? How to be the, your best? Because it's a very good example of what happened with you, you know, to show that people can create that transformation, but you have to work hard. Yeah, there's there's two parts to this. One, I think in being being a scientist helped me because to collect data that I knew people needed to see and that people wanted to understand 
to really like coach the game the right way and learn the right technique, I had to be really, really precise. So I had to be, I couldn't make mistakes. If I made a, if I had a flawed, for example, I worked with the Chicago White Sox in 1982 and 83, mm-hmm. 84. And I had, they wanted me to look at base running. Well, I needed the camera to be absolutely at 90 degrees when the player came into the picture. But mm-hmm. how am I going to get the timing when they come into the picture? So I decided that I would put a block right here, film them at first base. And if they took off running, I turned the camera on. Camera starts accelerating to get up to about 200 frames a second. And then I track the player and then it blocks at 90 degrees so that when they start their slide, I can quantify what was going on with the slide into second base. So you had to be really precise with your technique. That's one. The second took me a lot longer, and that's the personal piece of purpose. You know, who are you at your best self? What really matters to you? What matters most in your life? And I think that's harder to get to for a lot of people because sometimes we as teachers, we teach, we don't listen. And when you operate on a sense of purpose, you have empathy and you care about other people. And I think that was a little harder for me. And I I know it was a little harder. Um, In fact, some would say a lot harder. Uh, but it's it's taken me time. But I think those two aspects, there's the technical side, then there's the purpose side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, having a complete evolution like human being. No, it's like a, a big process yeah. to keep uh, developing yourself. And what it takes, let's say, when you are working with, because which is related, your response is related to my next, my next question. It's when you are coaching, you know, and also you are leading a team, a team of people. You did a lot of the Human Performance Institute. Which are the key, let's say, principles, concepts that you apply? Well, I think as a teacher, as a coach, I think you have to absolutely care about your student, number one. It's not about you. You know, I, I, I remember back in the day, I, and again, I'm not going to call any names out. This is not yeah. about throwing anybody under the bus or anything. But I had people say to me, look, this science stuff is all well and good, but I'm the coach. Like, I'm the coach. I'm going, okay. Um, but but it was like, like, I've got the information. I know what to do instead of being open-minded to learning. I mean, that's the one thing that I know I've had to personally do, you know, you know, it's one that you have a PhD. I mean, you get, you get so far in your career and, but if you're, if you're, if you still want to learn and you still want to grow, you care about your student, you love your student, you give, and that means tough love, by the way, that you care about them getting better. Then you can help them not only with technical, but with their fitness, with their nutrition and, and so on. I think then you can really help people if you care. Yeah, absolutely. And which is related by by next question which is which are the value the principles that you consider because we have on our episodes uh, many many coaches <clears throat> looking watching the episode from all over the world what do you consider are the key values and principles for to be a tennis coach well i think you've got to be a learner number one i think you've got to be a listener number two the l's the three l's and i think you've got to love what you do and the student you know, great coaches, I think, learn from their students. I don't think great coaches know everything. You you really become a better coach when you really listen to your student and you understand your students. So, I mean, I've got three C's of coaching. I got three L's of coaching. And so the L's are learner, listener, and love. And the C's? <laughs> oh, the C's? Okay, if you want those now. Character, curiosity, and connection. So have, be a person of high character and integrity. Be a person who's curious, curious about what's happening. Don't just assume things are the way they are and then be a connector. Now, that those kind of go hand in hand. You could say, well, if I'm a learner, I'm curious. Not necessarily. Curiosity creates the 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 question. Learning is is absorbing the knowledge. Curiosity creates the question. People say, well, if I'm if I'm a listener, I'm a connector. No, you're not. If you're a listener, that's part that's empathetic. You can have empathy, but. Really, the connection piece is giving energy of yourself to others, not just just not just speaking and then assuming something happens. Yeah. So I think they're very there's six very different things, but there's the three L's and the three C's. Uh, very good one and very good advice for 
our audience. And, and, and talking about that, because we are talking about leadership and uh, connection, I think is behind tennis, no? And we need more things that we can, uh, we can talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. If you see, because you did work in the Human Performance Institute now mm -hmm. and the uh, Judson University and also in a different, uh, different project that you did, which are the, let's say the value, the, the key aspects of the guys, let's say the, the Djokovic, the Nadal, the Federers, but also you you tested, you know, some of them in other industry, in other business, you know, the top right. ones. Right. Which are right. which are the, the differences, how they think, how they they behave, if you you can describe something about them. Well, obviously you have to you can't even start without saying they're extremely confident. Um they're extremely confident, but they, they even they have to be careful of being egotistical because the ego, if the ego comes out too much, they, it, it actually shows insecurity. Yeah. But they have to have ultimate confidence. I think the thing that really sticks out for me, what ultimate confidence is, they're not afraid to lose. And that's a huge deal. You know, mm -hmm. the kids today that play, I mean, they choke. I mean, there's there's only two reasons players choke. They care too much about the score. They care too much about what other people are thinking about them. And, you know, and I, I just start thinking, gosh, how do you develop confidence? So confidence, I think the greatest, the greatest ones in the world have incredible structure in their life. Yes, they're wealthy and they can hire people to support them. But even great college players understand structure mm -hmm. because human beings are creatures of habit. So we have to really fill, we have to fill that void. We can't just let life rip and just hope that everything falls into place. So it's structure. And then I think we just have to be learner. I think leaders are learners. And that's, so that, that's where I would start. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And if you compare, or let's say you can talk in terms of which are concepts, similar concepts that uh, yeah. top tennis players, top entrepreneurs, top, uh, let's say, politicians, different kind of people, which kind of, uh, let's say, principle are they are in common? Yeah, intensity, intensity. They, they are intense in how they practice their trade. They are mm -hmm. intense about their, they're very careful about their integrity. I mean, this is one of the problems we have in politics because people won't get outside and they won't talk. Um, and, but, but the idea of a great tennis player having an incredible amount of, of intensity. I mean, back in the day, for example, and this is one of the best word pictures, Jimmy Connors would only practice about one hour a day, but very few players could hang with him for one hour because it was so intense. And the great, the great players, they, you know, you got to work with each player because it's very different. Every, every player is a yeah. unique player, but there's an intensity to get better. Now, what does that take to get better? You know, some want to get very, like Tim Gullickson was very analytical. If, if, if today's high-speed video existed in Tim's career, mm -hmm. Tim would have been all over that. He just loved the, breaking things down. It didn't bother him. Other players, however, they go through paralysis by analysis if they start breaking things down like that. So there's a lot of availability and the intensity has to fit each unique player. But I think the word is intensity. Because it's intensity to get better, intensity to perform, intensity to have a great company, whatever it is. But then it's the structure and the confidence without ego, humility, if you will, and honor to be who you need to be, to be your best self. Very, very interesting. No, It means that uh, with the same values and same principles apply, yeah. you can work anywhere. You can be, you know, in any area in the business. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. That's why when Jim and I started doing this in sports science, I mean, how this all started, it's very fascinating because both of us, it happened differently. We were doing programs for coaches on sports science and how mm -hmm. you get better. And we'd have corporate executives come up to us and say, can you give the very same talk you gave to these players and coaches to my company? And we're going, really? <laughs> like, wait a minute. It, it, they go, yeah, it's not about hitting forehands, but everything else. Yeah. Talk to talk about that. The mental toughness, the nutrition, the the fitness, the role of physical training in your mental game. And so, I mean, it was amazing because that's how that's how we got HPI off the ground, that we started realizing that this model we'd been working on applied to almost any high stress arena. 
Yeah, very, very interesting because this is one of the key aspects to to develop. And, and what and right. what happened, Jack, in the opposite? Let's say because we are talking right now about the top top guys, top leaders, but the, mm -hmm. how to break down when some people are in the comfort zone? How to create an environment of grow and and how yeah. to learn? Well. I think we all have to be a little bit psychologist to understand this question. I'm, and I'm not a psychologist. I'm, I mean, I certainly train, I work in the field, but I'm not a clinical psychologist. But the thing is, is that we have to understand the psychology of what it takes because the players, they make things very, they make the great players make things very simple. They don't make it complex, but the lay person sees how great they are. And they'll see the tweener, for example, and they'll say, well, I've got to be, learn how to hit a tweener. No, you don't. As I, as I love to say, that sells tickets, that doesn't win matches. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't need to practice the, the, the trick shots to be yeah. a great tennis player. You know, simple will actually make you a better tennis player. Um, managing mistakes. I think what Jim did, Jim Laird did with the 16 second cure was brilliant. Yeah. One of the greatest contributions to all of sport. Um, and I think that's really where you have to start. Simple and, but nobody wants to get out of their comfort zone. See, we have to understand that as coaches, people don't like that. Very few people love getting out of their comfort zone, but that's where you grow. So as coaches, we can do it without telling them they're getting out of their comfort zone. So we can create drills. We can create games where they're getting out of their comfort zone and they're starting to get a grasp on what it takes to be better. And, and I'm very particularly in our sport, like because to be a top tennis player on, or normal tennis player competing, you have to be adaptable. No, that's one of the key aspects of our our sport. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and 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 so for less for those of us who are coaches, what we have to understand is what's the baseline. Where is my player right now? Measure that. See what gets measured gets done. So if you can measure with video th their strokes, if you can measure their fitness level their speed, their first step, if you can measure them doing a hexagon and work on their agility, if you can get a baseline and then start working from there, I mean, it's amazing what you can start doing when you measure things. And although that might sound like it's a little bit far out there, I'll tell you what gets measured gets done. Absolutely. Absol absolutely. And probably we need to learn more about that in our profession because sometimes we expect that only the competition or the tournaments are one way to have numbers in terms of the player rather to keep evaluating the process, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, it can be very qualitative, by the way, at first. It doesn't have to be numbers measured. You can take a video of a player. And every coach watching this has had this happen. You'll say to the player, look, you got to stop throwing your racket. And the player will look you right in the eye with all seriousness and say, I didn't throw my racket. Not this match, I didn't throw my racket. And the coach <laughs> yeah. says, well, let's look at this video. What's happening right here? They see them frisbee their racket against the fence. And they go, oh, I didn't remember doing it. They honestly don't remember doing it. So because their brain will block it out. Yeah. So we as coaches have to help them understand some of these things. So when I say measure, I'm not saying get a ruler and, and a calculator and put numbers to everything, but get a metric on everything, whether maybe it's even a subjective metric. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, this is also parent education. Help parents understand the role they're playing with their kids definitely. video parents video watch parents i mean yeah, it's amazing definitely, definitely. yeah it's ama it's, uh, exactly it's, uh, it's amazing how was yeah. how, how was that process during all the years in charge you did a lot uh, also to develop leaders you know uh, entrepreneurs mm -hmm. uh top executives how was that process many many years work in the human performance uh center how was uh the result let's say now that you are in another role. Yeah, the result was phenomenal. I mean, what we created was, I mean, the, Tufts University did some follow-up studies that people that had gone through our course 18 months to two years later were still reaping the benefits of the course. So, I mean, I feel more than confident that we did a really good job in contributing to thousands of people's lives. Um, so, I mean, I'm honored at that. Uh, but I think what, ha what we have to start thinking about is that the the measurements like we had, we did 360s so people would do a self-assessment verbally on themselves their habits then they would do a 360 so their family i mean there was one executive a woman she went through the course and she got feedback from her nine-year-old child that it said all i have to do to make mommy happy is give her her cell phone 
Now, that's a subjective child giving feedback. But I'll tell you, that mother never, ever brought her cell phone into the house right directly from work ever again. So that was a sub very subjective metric that caused an incredibly positive outcome. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, so absolutely. Think, absolutely. Yeah, we have to think about what are we trying to measure? What's the impact we're trying to make? Yeah. So that's what we did at the Human Performance Institute. And and also you did work a lot uh, in energy, you know, how to bring a very positive uh, energy and uh, the process and how you keep developing yourself to maintain a high level, like a human performance, no? Yeah. It, it was a matter of understanding that a human being is a biological organism. And as a biological organism, energy is not infinite. Energy is very finite, yeah. so yet you've got these leaders, these world-class leaders or athletes who want to get better, and they're training really, really hard, and they're putting themselves under a, a crucible of pressure, and they're not recovering. They're not recapturing their energy. So you've got these people that are taking huge risks emotionally in their lives and mentally to the they're, 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 if you're a ten tennis player at the US Open, I mean, you're basically naked out there on the court. You're all by yourself and the world will judge you. And it's being, that's a risk. So it's how do you manage your energy in the face of all that stress? And what Jim and I were able to teach was the idea of in, increasing, in, increasing your capacity to withstand the demand in your life. And then how do you recapture energy after the event or after the training so that now you're prepared for the next event? So it's yeah. episodes of stress and episodes of recovery that we were able to develop. And that's how we, and we called it the corporate athlete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an amazing project and also with the amazing results. And, and, and talking about that, no, how to manage energy, being a coach, being a leader, you are in the position to coach others. What do you mm -hmm. think, Jack, about how has to be the communication process when you are leading other people be in, a, uh, in the position to be a very <clears throat> positive leader right now? I think coaches have a huge responsibility, as do leaders. Leadership is a responsibility. It is not something you attain. Um, I climbed Kilimanjaro. When I got to the summit, I, could, I felt such a sense of not, not euphoria, not celebration. It was, wow, we did. This. It was almost humble. And that's just me, but I think leaders listen. They don't just speak. Coach, great coaches listen. They don't just speak. Great coaches, as I mentioned earlier, they want to learn from their students. Coaches have a great amount of knowledge, but they still want to learn. And I think they're trying to be congruent. You know, it's, I have a funny story about this kind of thing that I've worked with athletes for years because I went back to college, actually, to become a, a certified nutritionist. I went back to take classes before I got my license, and it was pretty fascinating. I, I remember working with many world-class athletes. Again, no names, uh, but they, we would talk about nutritional status, and the status being that eating well every day, just yeah. eating well every day to, to perform and to recover. But then they'd get on match day, and they'd look me in the eye, and they, it's almost like they want to have a cheat day. They emotionally feel, and I've had, I did have this happen eating really, really well. And then on match day, they'd say, coach, I, I don't know why, but I really want a hamburger. Well, let me explain this because now you see, we've got the trait. They're doing really, really well. And they tell me that on match day, that they think they'll play better if they have a hamburger. Guess what I'm doing, Fernando? I'm going, how would you like that burger cooked? Yeah, of course. It's an emotional <laughs> trick. It's an emotional <laughs> trick. It's, it, they think it's going to help them because it's not going to hurt them on that day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they've done well. Now, if they eat burgers every day and now they want a burger, I mean, you're just kind of going along for the motions because they're doing, they're not really doing anything to improve their nutritional status. But if they've been doing really well and they say they want something that's like a comfort food that they think will help them, I'm, I'm preparing it for them. Yeah, no, no, I, I, absolutely. And, and also talking about, let's talk a little, a little bit about the story of Kilimanjaro because you did yeah. uh, 
long preparation to do that. You were yeah. there with the sun. And also we saw the picture with the tennis racket playing on the, tennis racket. You know, on the top of so, the Kilimanjaro. How was that? So, so that? Yeah, that was fascinating. I mean, I've got artificial knees, first of all. Everybody should know that, that I have metal knees. And uh, so my son was only 12 years old. And so I, I used every bit of knowledge. I coached my rear end off with him. Fernando, when we were on the mountain, but we did all the preparation. We talked about emotionally the fear of the heights and, and, and it was, I mean, there were times on Kilimanjaro, it was, it was frightful because you're looking straight down a long way mm -hmm. and you've got to be careful. Um, and here you are with your 12 year old son. Um, there were times when it was, I was froze every night. The ground froze. It was, it got below freezing every night. You summit it at night. It was got down to zero the wind, I mean, you just feel awful. You, and yet you've just got to keep taking the next step. And we trained for it. We did. I used every bit of knowledge I had to help him get ready, to help me get ready. And we did. We made it to the summit. Yes, I took a net generation racket and ball <laughs> to the top. Yes. And the funny part about this is that when I, the guides and porters had no idea that I had done this. So I opened my backpack and I pulled this small racket out with the ball. They actually thought it was a weapon. They'd never seen one before. And they're going, what is that? What is that? Like, they're just screaming. And I'm going, guys, it's a sport. <laughs> and then they didn't know how to toss the ball to me. All I wanted was somebody to toss the ball underhanded so I could hit a volley. Yeah. And it's, it's over 19,000 feet high. You can't get your breath. And, and I'm laughing, and they can't toss the ball. And it fi I finally got a good volley. I just, and I just I volleyed the ball back to somebody. That's all I did. But to get the volley was just great. But to be able to do it with my 12-year-old son was really magnificent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a, a very interesting story, very successful in many, many ways. Thank you. you know, Thank of you. course, because it's your family, but also how you prepare mm -hmm. yourself you know, to, to do that, which is a very good story to share. Because you climb your own Kilimanjaro no? and everything that you, do, you did in your life. That's the one thing that I think is a great lesson from Kilimanjaro that I learned that my son is 12. Remember that. That's really yeah. key because a 12 year old, he could have been doing it to, to he could have been climbing to make his dad proud or to not let me down. That would have been very dangerous. So I had to train him how to own his climb. And I made it very safe. Look, if you don't make it, that's OK. We're climbing this together. We have to go down together because he's a minor. If I don't make it because of my age or whatever. He's got to go down with me. Mm -hmm. So I had to get him to own his climb. And I think we have to train players to own their match. Be the owner of how you play. Be the owner. How many times do we ever say to players, they'll hit a weird shot and we'll go, you don't own that shot. Why would you even try that shot? Yeah. You never practice that shot. Why would you hit a shot you don't own? And I think in helping my son learn how to own his climb, it helped him. And then two years after that, I mean, Many of your viewers might not know this. He won the national championship 14 and under in team Kumite Karate in the AAU. And I think part of it was because he learned how to own his own training, how to own his own situation in the fight that he had to fight two years later. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, Jack, how was, because we read your books uh, and also we published mm -hmm. many, many different posts about the importance because you did very good tennis books, which Thank are you. focused on sports science and Thank the you. sports science approach. And also you did work for the USTA creating the sports science committee. Uh, how was uh, from there to right now being the USPTA uh, life tennis achievement for the recognition? How was that process uh, uh, of contribution for our sport? Wow. What a incredible question. I think any contribution I ever made to the game or to anyone's life was because I loved the game. I love the game so much. People may not understand this, but it's actually in the, the tribute video that the United States Professional Tennis Association made that um, I started playing at third. I started, I had a lesson when I was 11, but I never really picked it up till I was 13. And then my friend and I, Bill Wicks, he and I would play every day because my father had struggles and it got me out of the house with my father. So mm -hmm. he and I would play five hours a day, but I basically taught myself to play. So I developed a love. I had no one imposing something on me. Yep. And I just loved it. I loved the exercise. I loved the competition. I loved the one-on-one. -on -one. 
Bill and I played doubles together. We did pretty well. And then I walked on the team at Illinois. I made the team as a freshman. And then I became a coach later on. I mean, that's another part of the story. But I think what my any contribution I've ever made that would be responsible for getting me into the Hall of Fame, Fernando, is because I loved the game so much. So when I became a sports scientist, I loved I had such a curiosity and I never want to lose that, by the way. I tell my students at Judson University right now that mm -hmm. I'm obviously like three generations ahead of them. And I'll say to them, look, I don't care. I can't do anything about aging, but I don't have to get old. So I always want to have, even at my age and everybody look at me with the white hair and everything, I want to have a childlike curiosity. Yeah. So I believe it was that childlike curiosity that helped me ask questions about the game and how to get better ment physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, how to get better all the time. So it's just like climbing Kilimanjaro, take one step at a time. If you keep taking one step at a time, you'll make it to the top of the mountain. And so that was it. I just kept asking questions. And how can I help these coaches? How can I help these players? And it was that curiosity. So if anything led to it, it was that, the love of the game and the curiosity. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you for, for asking that. that question. I'm honored. Thank you. No, no, no thank you. Thank you to you for all the contribution that you did for our sport. We need to we need to keep improving our recognition and structure in our sport, and I truly believe in that. And uh, Jack, how prepare the new generations on that? Because we, it seems that we need to prepare the next generation of coaches like a leader, a basis and purpose, and a love of the game. Uh, probably we need to. What do you think? How? Looking for the future of our sport. Well, the blessing that I have right now, Fernando, is that I work with Gen Z. All the students I work with are between 18 and 22. So this is the so I've got there's I've got several thoughts on this. This is the first generation in history that's grown up with technology, um, and technology has been very easy for them. I mean, to the point that if one person wants to ask another person out for a date, they will text each other. They won't yeah. communicate it, and because it's easier to like if the if the second person says no, that rejection is much easier to see on my screen yeah, than absolutely. no to your face. So we have a it, training leaders. The new generation of leaders is going to be very different than it was back in the day. So I would be very naive to say, well, here's what we need to do, because. I think what we need to do is step back and understand, just like I mentioned earlier on how we train great players, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with a generation that deals with technology, the first ever that's grown up with technology. So now what does leadership mean? What, what have they not learned? They've really not learned how to communicate very well. Uh, they want to. It's not that they don't want to. They want to communicate. They just haven't had to. Yeah. Why? Why, why do that if I ha don't have to? Uh, empathy. How do you learn empathy through a, a device? And again, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. I love these kids I work with. I love them to death. But I'm just saying this is the nature of the beast that we're trying to, to, to mold into a future leader. So we have to create that desire within them to learn because it's a different kind of learning than you and I had. Yeah. Especially, you know, I'm older than you are, but I mean, you were forced into the crucible of connection and relationship and You know, you had to face the music if you did something wrong. And today, it's a lot easier to navigate without pressure. Yet they have pressure. They have amazing pressure because the time is taken. I mean, we can go into the conversation about why don't we have, why isn't tennis, why isn't everybody playing tennis? Well, there's too many options. Yeah. But I mean, I think I want to come back to your to your question. The leadership development is going to have, we got to really, we got to put a microscope on what does it take to train the future leaders of the world. And, and also talking about that, which is related, what do you say? Uh, there are a lot of pressure right now with the social network and uh, you, you can receive a lot of critics, a lot of words without to know the people, you no, know, which is you are yeah. exposed right now to a different level also of, uh, you know, the pressure. Well, that's correct. I mean, again, you know, I don't know how the athletes today do it, actually. I really don't. I, 
because they're they're connected to their phones. This is the method of communication. There's science out there that's I mean, I'm not this is nothing new what I'm going to say right now, but there's all kinds of science that shows that we've never been so connected as a, as a society ever, but we've never been so alone and isolated. So, yes, we're connected, but that doesn't mean we are connected. If yeah, you yeah, see yeah. what I'm saying, yeah, yeah, we're absolutely. connected. We're connected here. We're not connected here with the heart. Yeah. And that is a different kind of connection that takes work. Um, and, you know, we so so the idea I mean, I struggle with poor, the poor athletes who, you know, there was one athlete. Again, I'm not going to mention any names. Everybody knows who this athlete is if you follow the news at all. But this athlete, a young American, lost last year's U.S. Open, not this year, and actually got death threats on social media. And I'm sitting here going, who is overseeing that athlete's access? Because was that happening before? Sure it was. There were people that would think something negative like that, mm -hmm. but they didn't have yeah. a mechanism by which to express it yeah. that they could hide behind. Now they have a mechanism to express it that they can hide behind. Yeah. So now you get that reptilian brain to show itself. I mean, I really struggle with athletes and their access to everything that's possibly said because you have to develop a resilience that we never had to develop before. In, yeah. in, in the day, you know, when I was working with players way back in the day, I mean, all they had to do was not turn the news on and not read the newspaper. That was it. And they could be on their own, watch a movie in the hotel room, go out to dinner and just do their job. Now, because our phone is also our text, it's also our email, it's also everything. Now you're just bombarded with sensory input constantly. That's gonna That takes work to help grow in that environment. No, absolutely. And it's a great, great challenge because also you need to be in social network mm -hmm. to increase marketing concepts, uh, new project, yeah. new product. Yeah. It's like a, a circle, a very, very difficult circle. Uh, we, we can talk by hours. No, I know we could. Jack. I know we could. But uh, um, let me ask you a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, what do you think, talk, talking about the evolution, which is what do you think about the new rule? of the ATP allow, allowing uh, the coaches do coaching, you know, but with yeah. more transparency. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm, I'm sort of sitting on the fence. So what I'll do is present both sides of the argument as I see them. I love the integrity of the game. I love the fact that when coaching wasn't allowed, even though they would try, they would try to sneak it or some signals or something. I liked the idea that a player had to figure it out by herself or by himself on the court. That was part of the magic of being a great competitor in our sport. So I think there was some magic there, some secret sauce that for those of us that are real tennis aficionados, that was a beautiful thing. However, now to allow coaching, now I'm going to go on the other side of the fence. I think it's going to add another element to spectatorship. I think it'll be more entertaining. I think it will add an element that it may not be the best for the integrity of the game as those of us who've grown up with it, but it yeah. may be very, very helpful from the entertainment perspective to get more people connected to the sport. Because we see, you know, in, in the NBA, for example, or the NFL, when they call a timeout and there's a huddle, we, we, we go, yeah. the camera goes right in yeah. and sees the coaches and, and to have that, And then to, for the commentators to be able to talk about that, what just happened, I mean, I think it's going to add an element that we've, it's going to be a beautiful thing from, an, from a spectator perspective. Well, from I a know, player I'm, perspective, who's going to be your best, who's going to be the higher, the best coach from a player yeah, perspective? Of course, of course. And, and I think it's a part of the evolution that we need to do. That's why we create uh, the coaches' voices, no? The tennis talk coaches' voices. Or yeah, voices. exactly. Because we need to do a voice. This year, US Open did a very good thing. The, having the coaches of the finalists and the semifinalists on the uh, the coaches on the press conference, doing uh, yeah. Juan Carlos Ferrero uh, speaking about well, what happened in the match, which is much better to understand our game for the rest of the people, which is good. No? Yeah, it adds to the spectators' experience. Yeah. Absolutely. And let me let me ask you, because you are, you know, 
taking all the experience, all the success that you did and that you are doing in the Justson University. Yeah. And uh, how is it, how is the that project? You know, it's great. Being at Judson has been a true blessing. I mean, I have a joint appointment in, I'm a professor in business and also a professor in exercise and sports science. I'm also the faculty athletic representative. So I work with all the athletes on eligibility and things. It's It's been amazing to be this guy who's probably older than some of their grandparents. And yet I'm very, very close to these kids and these young adults and to see them and what their needs are, it actually helps me have a conversation like this with you because mm -hmm. I get to see every day and I try not to judge. I try not, you know, I'm, I try to make the experience with me. I'm not your grandfather's friend. I'm, I'm your professor and mm -hmm. who, who had, who made the statement, I can't do anything about aging, but I don't want to get old. And so I try to make it entertaining for them. I try to understand what makes them tick. And it's really been an amazing experience for me. Because as I said earlier, you learn from your students. If you're a really good coach and teacher, you learn from your students. And I'm learning a lot from these young kids. No, and, and also, Jack, you prepare and, uh, human performance and different projects, a lot of big leaders, and you prepare them. Now yeah. you are teaching the next generations of leaders. The which future is, leaders, the future leaders. Yeah, That's right. Absolutely. I love it, too. Let, let, let me ask you the last question. Uh, okay. Are you are you enjoying your life in tennis and also your life, you know, coaching others, teaching others? Yeah, I mean, like right now, I get occasionally work out with the men's and women's tennis team at Judson, and, and we've got a great coach uh, in Coach Brett. And uh, the you know, I, I'm also working with a high school team. There's a couple of young players there. They're to, they're a couple of the top players in the state in their division in high school. I work with them. So, so I get to be a professor. I get to work in tennis. I get to, I mean, I'm honestly at this stage in life, I really couldn't be happier. So I'm as fulfilled as ever. Um, I feel like I have a purpose beyond anything I've almost ever had. It's kind of like, what am I going to do when I grow up, Fernando? That's yeah, kind of how I absolutely. feel. So let's, let's just keep growing together. Absolutely. Jack, many, many thanks for all the aspect and uh, contribution you, you did for tennis for our sport, for many generation also of leaders, and you are doing right now. We are very blessed and uh, honored to know you and to know all the things that you did. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Great to be with you, Fernando. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you very much, Jack. And thank you to all of you. Remember, we are creating a bridge with the top persons like Dr. Jack Groppel with you, because we want to create more awareness and more grow in our sport. Thank you to the GPTCA, Tennis One, and Segal Institute, which are producing this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. I am Alberto Castellani, president of GPTCA, Global Professional Tennis Coach Association. Learn from the best ATP coaches in the world. I hope that at the end of this course, you will learn a lot of things. I hope that I will see you on the circuit with your player. This is the goal.